I always get a kick out of doing these things. All right. There we go. Welcome, everybody. What are we on now? Episode 3, No More Mr. Nice Guy, going through the sidebar. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. Thank you. I already see as many likes as concurrent watchers, so that's awesome. I'm really glad you guys are enjoying the series. And if you just got here from the Married Red Pill or No More Mr. Nice Guy subreddits, welcome. Um, I guess let's get started. So we've already talked before about what makes a nice guy, how to define a nice guy. The next part here is, as Dr. Glover puts it, learning to please the only person who really matters. So get that one up let's get started um, it's an interesting thing he starts off the chapter with so as Glover puts it from the perspective of this guy Todd which you know you've heard a bunch of the archetypes from before I'm a chameleon revealed Todd a 30 year old single nice guy I will become whatever I believe a person wants me to be in order to be liked if you remember before that's from the uh, previous mental guy paradigm where if you act the way everybody wants you to act they'll give you the love you desire and your life will go simple and easy we all know it doesn't work that way otherwise you wouldn't be here i'll continue uh, with my smart friends i act intelligent and use a big vocabulary around my mother i look like the perfect living son with my dad i talk sports with the guys at work i cuss and swear whatever it takes to look cool underneath it all though i'm not sure who i really am or if they just like me for or if they would just like me for who I am. I can't figure out what people want me to be. I'm afraid I will be all alone. The funny thing is, I feel alone most of the time anyways. So just about everything a nice guy does is consciously or unconsciously calculated to gain approval or avoid disapproval. Nice guys seek this as external validation in just about every relationship or social situation, even from strangers they don't particularly like. Todd is an example of a man who because of intellectualized toxic shame, believes he has to become what he thinks other people want him to be. Nice guys believe this chameleon-like metamorphism is essential if they hope to be loved, get their needs met, and have a problem-free life. So the problem with this comes in that trying to please anybody or everybody, you don't actually please anybody. And most importantly, that includes yourself. I'm going to bounce back and forth between a couple interesting topics here, but... Um, Glover uses a word to describe the value-seeking arrangements. He uses attachments. Now, you're going to notice a lot of this stuff kind of sounds a lot like if anybody's ever done pickup, what they talk about is props. In a pickup stand, I mean, in a pickup perspective, that makes sense. The props kind of do what they do. The problem is, as Carl from Black Label Logic put it, buying into your own mark, like believing you're actually Hulk Hogan and you're not actually just, you know, Terry, you can't really buy into your mark because that's where these problems kind of stem from here. So there has to be a certain level of detachment from the things that you like in your life. Like, uh, what's that line from Fight Club? The things you own end up owning you. And that's kind of where it fits into here. So as he describes it, nice guys attach their identity and worth to these things and use them to convince themselves and others that are valuable. Without these attachments, nice guys don't know what else about themselves would make anyone like or love them. Being a nice guy is the ultimate attachment. They believe their commitment to being good and doing it right, good and right are in quotations, was what makes them valuable and compensates for their internalized belief that they are bad. Uh, if you don't remember from chapter two, we talked about that in the previous episode where there's two different mental models that nice guy have. There's the one that I'm inherently a bad person and I'm inherently a good person. The inherently bad bad one is that crippling insecurity they have to hide constantly by being what they think the other person wants them to be usually from the perspective that they think they know what other people want them to be which always ends up being wrong it's just a projection of their own bias and because of all this it makes it impossible for them to understand why somebody would like them i'm going to use an example from uh actually this is a great pickup example so you'll see a lot of guys who entered that space, like Mystery, uh, RSD, a lot of those guys, they'll end up learning a system, the system works, and they end up sleeping with women, but they end up not liking the women afterwards, because in their mind, it was still parlor tricks and games. Now, if I could pull a fast one on this girl, and she liked me because I did all these goofy tricks, then she's obviously stupid, 
So why would I like her? And that taps into the whole manipulative part of it. In reality, what you're supposed to do is just adopt the system as like a crutch or training wheels. You learn how to well, give it some amount of structure and then you kind of plug your own life into the pieces as they go on and then you learn that you can just be who you are. I don't want to say be yourself because that's just loaded with so much baggage, but you can kind of approach these things more naturally. But once you start thinking of the training wheels as if they're the bicycle, that's when you run into problems. So it'll be great. They have breaking free exercises in here. I'd suggest you guys give them a shot. In this one here, he asked guys to write down examples of their uh, of their attachments. And I'm going to go on a bit of a tangent here because this is a wonderful little... Uh, oops, where is it? There it is. Great article by The Last Psychiatrist. So this guy... I reference him a lot. Let me just uh, interact with this one. He's kind of red-pilled before red-pilled was a thing. So, like, he was big in the early 2000s with his blog. He was a psychiatrist dealing a lot heavily with narcissism. And so when he talks about attachments, here's something else here that you can take that expands on the concepts. It's his article, If this is one of the sexiest things you've ever seen, you may be a narcissist. I'm not going to read the whole thing here, but the part I will is this primer on narcissism where he talks about, like when everybody thinks about narcissism, they think about the DSV-5 or the uh, psychological manual for it, which is grandiose sense of self-importance, um, removing everybody as like human beings, they become set pieces in your life, which is, I mean, it's good, but it's... It's got that problem with all dogs or poodles or all poodles or dogs. I'm sure you've heard the saying before, but it's diagnosing the symptoms. It's not actually dealing with the root cause. And he makes the case that the root cause is not that a narcissist has a grandiose sense of self. It's that a narcissist has an inner monologue that is detached from reality and he expects everybody else to conform to it. Otherwise, he performs what's called a narcissistic rage if he doesn't get what's called narcissistic fuel. Now, if you're wondering why I'm referring to narcissism so much, we're talking about nice guys. Aren't they supposed to be passive and insecure? Well, yeah, but that stems from narcissism in their mind. And if you remember before from the last chapter, remember where I talked about there is uh, inherently good and inherently bad paradigms that nice guys follow? Well, those are those narcissistic scripts that they have in their head. And other people accommodating them is the fuel, which is this, if I act the way I think they want me to act then they'll love me forever and my life will be easy. That's the narcissistic fuel they crave. And when other people don't give it, you end up bidding a cycle of resentment. Now, back to the heels. We talked about attachments. And I'm going to skip the part here. So consider the narcissist who wants his wife to wear only white high-heeled pumps. The narcissist wants this because, not because he himself likes white high-heeled pumps, which he might, but because the type of person he thinks he is would be with the type of woman who wears high-heeled pumps. Again, it's all about the signaling. Okay, close that. I don't need to interact anymore. We're going to go back to no more Mr. Nice Guy. It's all about the signaling. And that's a very important thing. Because if you'll notice, it's just prevalent on social media right now. How, um, what's the recent thing here? I guess Black Lives Matter, Antifa, the Seattle and the cop thing, all that. You're going to see... The actual event and the actual grievance, which is a fairly valid grievance. Nobody wants people who have the use of legal use of force to be oppressive. That goes without saying. But that's been completely warped in this day and age to the point where everybody's focused on the symbols. Everybody's focused on what their group identity means. And if you don't think uh, that the BLM hashtag is an, is an attachment like these, then haven't been paying attention. So... It's kind of neat because once you understand what Glover's talking about in here, you're able to see it in society writ large. And it's just everywhere. Um, part he goes on next here, which is I really want to expand on this one here because I love this section. This is where you can tell if somebody is actually, like, for example, Red Pilled himself has become self-actualized or he's just kind of LARPing or going through the stages. When he talks about nice guy attachments here, there's a section about seeking the approval of women. So 
nice guys seek approval and validation in just about every social situation, but their request for approval is most pronounced in their relationships with women. Nice guys interpret women's approval as the ultimate validation of their worth. Signs of women's approval can take the form of her desire to have sex, flirtatious behavior, a touch, a smile, or attentiveness. On the other end, if a woman is... Let me get my G Fuel out of the way here. I can't read. Use code PewDiePie for 30% off. <laughs> At the other end, if she's depressed, in a bad mood, or angry, guys interpret these things to mean she's not accepting or approving of them. So there's a few things to take away from this. The first is on the positive side. And this this is where guys get it right, but I don't think they get it right in the way they mean it. When sex isn't everything and not everything is about women and you're putting pussy on a pedestal, I'm sure you guys have all heard those memes. And they're all true to a large extent. But here's the thing. He uses very careful language there where he says it's the be-all and end-all. Like, What was the specific wording he used here? Let me get that so I don't... The ultimate validation of their worth. Notice that, the very hyperbolic language. And that means not that there isn't value in being able to like get sexual gratification from girls, but just treating it as the ultimate validation. And that's what the problem comes with here. So, I mean, let's face it. There's not very many time-tested and true sources of external validation, like real ones. For guys, it's mostly sex and violence, danger and play, sure you've heard one or two of the others being able to beat another man in a competitive thing is arguably the closest we can come to validation on the same level that like hunger does when we finally eat that euphoria that falls from it sleeping with women is another one of those now i'm not saying you need to use you know winning the tournament in your mixed martial arts gym versus you know sleeping with three girls that week not a 50 50 percent thing but you have to realize those are powerful motivations and they are powerful indicators of success. They just are. But you can't attach an identity to them and you can't make them an attachment. Because once that happens, then you lose what's called outcome independence. And if you don't know, outcome independence is the way, I guess it's a, it's a more refined way to describe being aloof to somebody else. So you've done something deliberate in your life, whether it's going to sleep with a woman, whether it's being more attractive for your wife, whether it's you know, whatever competition you want to put. In this case, we're going to stick to the women one because that's what Glover here is doing. Once you attach that, or once you detach that from your identity, it becomes the thing where, okay, the situation's either going to go this way or it's going to go this way, and I'm fine with either scenario. Let's use uh, Sleeping With Girls for an example. I actually talked about this in my book, Fuck Files, on Kobo, Amazon. Check the links in the description, yada. You know the spiel. Being able to sleep with women was, it was fun. I mean, everybody, it is obviously fun. It's made to be fun. It's in our genes to think it's fun or we just wouldn't do it. But once I got to the point where uh, the chase was more fun than the catch or just the process of learning something, like in my case, I treated pick up like it was tradecraft. Oh, I want to get better at approaches. Oh, I want to see if I can approach with this thing that's not supposed to work and make it work for me through body language or force of will or whatever. Whether I actually got a girl or not was irrelevant because it was a very fun and entertaining way to spend your time. And I had very little downtime at the time I was sailing with the Royal Canadian Navy. That outcome independence was how you prevent yourself from turning into, I don't know, for example, let's say a Rouge, who treated girls as the center of his world. And when they didn't feed into his narcissistic fantasy of, I mean, it's very traditional beliefs i guess i mean if you follow him you can kind of see it but they didn't follow it now all women are trash and watching cardi b is the next step to uh you know homosexual sex and all that kind of stuff he rants about you gotta put things in their proper place and on the flip side of the coin when we're talking about uh the negatives that resent building thing here and this is where seeking women's approval requires nice guys to constantly monitor the possibility of a woman's availability and it's the possibility of availability here, which is what we're describing. If it sounds familiar, if it sounds like simps, it's simps. Gauging the possibility of a girl's availability. And this is where it's constant neediness, it's constant validation seeking. On a very limited level, it's going to be a guy who likes every girl's post on Instagram or always sends haze to her DMs as soon as she tweets out something that shows a little bit of leg. 
all the way up to like a more relationship focused one where, you know, if a guy does more chores, then a girl's comfortable and it, maybe she would have sex more. And actually, I think that's the example he uses here. So since nice guys see sex as the ultimate form of acceptance and they must believe that a woman is in good mood before she will have sex, these men are constantly diligent not to do anything that might upset a woman who they desire. In addition, if the woman they desire is angry, depressed, in a bad mood, they believe they must do something quickly. Lie, offer solutions, sacrifice, manipulate to fix it. A couple things to break off in this too, which is awesome. I love how he's put it this way. Do you remember earlier when we said that uh, I do what I think the other person would want in order to get their love? Well, this is a case of guys pretending they can read minds. Anybody who slept with a girl for any length of time will know her being in a good mood is not contingent onto your sexual frequency. In fact, makeup sex is probably something that every guy in a relationship knows. You have a giant fight and afterwards, very hot, very passionate, cool. So obviously she doesn't have to be in a good mood. At the same time, a lot of guys have had that Sunday morning romp where everybody's really tired or kind of hung over and just kind of going through the motions. It still feels good. It's still fun. It's not something that's dependent on comfort. But if it's a nice guy personality or a nice guy mental model, which in this case equates to a nice guy's narcissistic script, he assumes all those things because he wants to be comfortable because he wants to be happy all the time. If you remember before, the last part, like I said, I keep going back to it. The nice guy paradigm. If I do what I think she wants me to do, then she will love me and my life will be problem free. That comfort is something a guy is searching for there as a nice guy. And he's projecting it onto other people. Which is why all these validation seeking things reek of creepiness. When you take a step back, it's like... Have you ever been in an argument with somebody and they throw an accusation at you that makes no sense? The one thing I can tell you is that the other person is literally thinking that or is guilty of it and they're projecting it onto you. Or, again, back to the book. One of the nicest lines you're going to hear when you're on a date with a girl is have her look over, turn to you, and say, you know we're not going to have sex tonight, right? Because in your mind, you never brought it up. You never were thinking, like, you're obviously thinking about it, but you never brought it up. You never hinted at it. She just came out of the blue with it. So what you can take from that is that that was something she was thinking about and an argument she was having inside her head and she projects it onto you. Same thing here. So these are the things the guys want and he projects it onto the person assuming he can read their mind. Kind of like a version of the golden rule. Do unto others as you have them do unto you. But it's not a healthy way of doing it. And here's the problem then, yeah. So he's not getting his narcissistic feel for this narcissistic script. So what is he doing? Offering solutions, sacrificing himself, manipulating. All this stuff is very unattractive. And that's the two rules of attraction. Be attractive, don't be unattractive. Be attractive is easy. You're going to see a ton of guys talking about hit the gym, hit the weights, lose weight. And I've said the same myself. But they completely ignore the second side of the thing, which is summed up as calling it simping. Fair enough. But the possibility of availability extends beyond just sex. Since nice guys have been conditioned by their families and society to never do anything to upset a woman, they are hyper-vigilant in responding to the moods and desires of women they don't even plan on having sex with. And that's the rub. White knighting? The guy actually doesn't think he's trying to sleep with the girl. He's just running off an of instinct. Defend the whammon is a typical nice guy behavior built on a crippling insecurity. And that's why... Every time you hear some guy white knighting for a girl, like online or in your social circle, that standard response that always shuts it down is like, I hope she sees this, bro. And that's why that's such a powerful, powerful statement. Because you're acknowledging there right away. You're doing this for her validation. I hope she sees this and I hope you get what you're looking for from this. And right there, the nice guy hates to have all this stuff exposed. He's actually very secretive, very manipulative. He doesn't like it to be an overt thing. He likes it to be a covert contract. So when you expose it as overt like that, it tends to be embarrassing and he has to walk it back. So it's a very, very uncomfortable place for a guy to be. Now, from a practical standpoint, in the next section here, seeking women's approval tends to give women the power to set the tone of the relationship. This is chore play 101. Every time a guy's been in a marriage where he's been slipping, loses frame, acquiesces to a girl too much, tries to make her comfortable, does all of these nice guy behaviors, he will end up hearing something to the effect of, at some point, 
well, maybe if you did more chores around this house, I'd be comfortable and we would sleep and I'd be more inclined to sleep with you. Any guy who's worth anything, who's been any relationship will tell you that this trap, all it does is get you doing more dishes and gets you away from her. I have, I think, I think I did a video on chore play. What I want to say was a salsa and chore. It was one of my cooking videos anyway. Yeah, I got, I'd have to go back and look. It's one of the early ones. Anyway, I'm sure if you search chore play on my YouTube channel, you'll find it there. Um, so seeking women's approval creates rage towards women. I call this the Roosh. <laughs> I know I keep dunking on him this time, but whatever. He had it coming. So most nice guys claim to love women, but the truth is most of the men have tremendous rage towards women. This is because we tend to eventually despise whatever we make into our God. If you'll notice, you ever wondered why I was always posting those women of Willendorf uh, photos on social media? Well, this is why. Once you prioritize women to the point where it's almost like a deity, then yeah, you're going to get resentful when your God doesn't rain manna from the heaven. I hope she sees this same thing. Putting women on a pedestal in an attempt to win their approval sooner or later, that adoration will turn to rage when she doesn't reciprocate as you wanted. I think that what he, eh, he basically says it when she fails to live up to nice guy expectations. <laughs> I like his next sentence, though. This is why it's not unusual to hear a nice guy proclaim his undying love to a woman in one breath and then ragefully call her <laughs> an F and C only moments later. Totally true. So the thing to note from this is if you're this guy in this situation, you got to be able to understand. Oh, there's my mouse. You got to understand why you're doing this. Most guys, you're going to see why you're doing Like you can see it very easily in other people. But when it's you, it's very difficult. And that's because you're not ego invested when it's somebody else. Ooh, a little busy in the chat here. I'll deal with you guys. We'll come to that at the end here. Um... His breaking free exercise number five, which I would say is the most important one out of all of them, is if you didn't care what people thought of you, how would you live your life differently? If you were not concerned with getting the approval of women, how would your relationships with the opposite sex be different? And of all the lessons through uh, my community or the married red pill or even the red pill community has tried to impart, this is the strongest one. What would you like? Uh, how did I phrase it? Guy complaining about his wife. She doesn't do this. She doesn't do that. She's very lazy. I've been working out now for three weeks and she hasn't even gotten off the sofa. Like, all right, let's say your wife died tomorrow. How would you live? Just do that. And that's, I find it's like a very easy model to live by. Because then a guy's like, she's not even a factor. And any chance you have of validation seeking or pedestalizing or deering, any of that stuff is gone. You just treat her like she's dead. The relationship, we broke up and she's just living in the house waiting to get a thing out. Usually guys give a little bit of pushback, but you'd be surprised. It's not very much when you go, oh, that means I have to make the kids lunches. And that means I have to do all the laundry. And that means I got to fold the sheets. And that means I got to earn money. And that means I got to like, and then they just, they talk about all these things they have to do, but then they do them. It's a great post by Archwinger in this, by the way, I wish I could pull it up, but I didn't prepare for it. Cause it just kind of came to me here where he talks about how he had done a staying at home or stay at home mom job it took him four hours and he's like this is great i would do this every day a lot of guys realize once they handle their life as if they don't need the approval of others their life is much easier like rich says himself uh guys have a notorious need to complicate their lives and then once you start 100 doing everything in your own life you realize how easy it is to maintain a life you like and this flips the script to validation to the point where it's not that you're trying to please the girl. It's that you're looking at her, you know, frumpopotamus sitting on the couch eating bonbons, complaining about this, that, or the other thing going, my life's basically on lock and it wasn't too hard. So what does she offer? And for a lot of guys, it's that realization when they get the, I like to call it the wife goggles slapped off their face. If you guys don't know what this concept is, wife goggles is a descriptor for male's aspirational model of love. When we get in a relationship with a girl, when we first hook up with her as like that hot 19 year old, that's the image that's locked in their head. For the rest of our life, every time we look at our girl, all of her wrinkles get smoothed off, her behavior gets smoothed off, and we still see that same hot 19 year old girl. Call those wife goggles. Once you get to a point 
where she acts sufficiently bitchy, whether it's because of your nice guy behaviors or maybe she just is, regardless of the way it happened. But eventually what happens through some kind of trauma or prolonged experience, you're either going to have learned helplessness to the point where you can't remove them and it's kind of like a psychological problem at that point, or many guys just get it slapped off their face and then she goes from that hot 19 year old you've remembered for 20 years to now she's the 45 year old one that's uh been nagging you for three years and you just see her and you never see her the same again it's really tragic that girls can ruin relationships like that because it's very hard to do that but once it's done it's amazing how easy it is to guy to start acting in his own self-interests which ends up making him more attractive in general, not just to a wife or a girlfriend, but to everybody. And most likely, he will notice he will have more fulfillment in his own life. And that's kind of the key. I wish there was an easy way to do it, but unfortunately it's like, yeah, <laughs> hating her just a little bit seems to be the way that's worked the best over the most period of time. Uh, his next section is about cover-up artists. Now this is, I would argue, one of the most important parts of this chapter, if not the whole book. And he brings up a story. When my son Steve was nine, he accidentally poked some holes in our kitchen table with a ballpoint pen. When he realized what he had done, he immediately showed his mom the damage. Steve had appropriate, healthy shame about his mistake. He knew that his actions had caused damage to the table. He also knew he had to take responsibility. Most importantly, he knew he wasn't bad. If I had done the same thing as a child or even an adult, I would have had an attack of toxic shame and tried my best to hide or deny what I had done. I would have been convinced that someone was going to be angry at me and stop loving me. I would have lived with the secret as well as a constant fear of being found out. So numerous nice guys have commented that they couldn't relate to my son's situation. Without exception, everyone admitted they would have done the opposite of what he did. Tried to cover it up. And that's hiding the badness. Nice guys believe they have to hide or distract attention from perceived shortcomings. If they forgot something, if they're late, if they broke something... Anything that's considered a wrong, they have to hide it. And this usually comes from two ways. One is attacking the other person. This is the whole, well, if I'm a bad person and you're a bad person, then nobody's a bad person. That's always the cutting people down to make yourself feel better approach. And the other one is just hiding it, lying about it, manipulating it. No, I wasn't late. No, I didn't do that. No, I definitely didn't uh, sleep with them. We we're just friends. Like, do you see the, do you see the, <laughs> the gimmicks there? So it's kind of neat. Well, I guess he calls it hiding the evidence, but... Uh... One of the things he uses here, which is kind of important on its own, is the way guys will um, hide the evidence. And One here, it's a very flawed mental model when it comes to relationships. He calls it drawing from the account, which I'm sure you guys have heard Rolo say this a lot, where it's um, guys treat relationships as if it's like a bank and there's relationship equity. Girls don't think that way. Girls have like a plus one, negative one at, 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 uh, view of relationship equity. Well, you did something nice. Well, you know, I stroked your ear last night. So we're one and one. So we're even. It's all washed out. You bought me a house. That's great. I kissed you on the cheek. One and one. We're even. So there is no relationship equity at all. And even if there was, the way people internalize that is so wrong, you're better off just not. So as he puts it, nice guys strive so hard to be good, giving and caring. They believe these acts build up a credit that wipes clean any wrongdoings they might do. Part of the nice guy's belief is that if he does most things right, no one should notice the few things he does wrong. Doesn't work that way. Everybody knows. Nobody notices how often you've shoveled your driveway, but everybody notices that time you didn't. And that's just how life works. So this, con this is going to constantly create a feedback loop of guys doing bad things and going through the toxic shame, going through the different hiding the evidence things, deflecting, attacking, that rage we had talked about, that misogyny where guys end up getting mad at women and calling them an F and C. This is all kind of built into the same feedback loop. And it's a horrible narrative to have, but so many nice guys have it. Because in their mind, why can't she follow the script that I said? I do the things that I think you want, and you're supposed to give me unconditional love. Well, it just doesn't work that way. Um, fixing is another one. This one, he says, mature people take responsibility when they make a mistake, apologize, make amends, or repair the damage. Conversely, nice guys try to fix the situation by doing it, whatever it takes to get the other person to stop being upset. I bet you anything, 
all you guys are thinking right now of an example of a relationship or marriage, either yours or somebody else's, where somebody did something wrong and so they bought flowers to make her feel better. And this is exactly what we're talking about. Don't fix things. Now, we talked before about, you know, fixing things if you're truly apologetic and feeling bad, but there's a difference between taking responsibility for your actions and trying to fix actions. The way we found it works best for uh, red pill guys is don't apologize ever. And a lot of guys take that to mean, what, you never apologize? Like you can do no wrong. You're just king shit. You're like, no, 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 never apologize. If you did something, you either meant to do it and you're not sorry, or you didn't mean to do it. And that's a my bad, mea culpa. All right, it won't happen the next time. But the thing is, actions are what matter. So by taking responsibility, you just don't do the things that you're not willing to accept. So you don't ever need to have an apology. If you did it, there was a reason. Well, why were you so mean to me? Hey, it's had to happen. I told you, don't yell at me. That's how it works. And again, he has the deer response. So this one, it's one of the acronyms that I would say, if you haven't learned it, learn it. You're not red-pilled until you can memorize this easily. Uh, the one he uses is deer. It's also referred to as jade, but um, deer is defend, explain, excuse, and rationalize. And they're fear-based responses. So if somebody accuses you of something, if your first thought is to defend yourself, then that's an unattractive behavior. It's a nice guy behavior. And what you're doing is you're using that fear and crippling insecurity to get them to change their mind about you because you don't want somebody to think badly of you. Same way thing an explanation. So if they only had the information I had, they would understand I'm not a bad person. Um, excuses are another one. Rationalization, that's probably one of the worst ones because rationalization is how you get to a dehumanized state. Could expand on that, but I don't want to turn this into a <laughs> reference about bad people doing bad things. Um, turning the tables, that would be... Here's the funny thing too. So turning the tables is what they would call in pickup terms, uh, pressure flip. Some girl gives you a fitness test, you know, oh, you think you're all that, don't you? And you kind of pressure flip, well, why would you even worry about it? Like, you know what I mean? Which works great in those initial interactions. If somebody's giving you a shit test and you come back with a pressure flip, it puts the onus on them to impress you as a person. But as a long-term strategy, it doesn't work. It's very, very short windowed, eight hour pickup interactions. That's another reason why you can't just run games like this your whole life. Eventually, you have to internalize things. And in this case, these are one of those ones that works early on, but you want to shed it pretty quickly. Um, he talks about walls. I mean, everybody should understand what it means by uh, putting a wall up between you and somebody. But Teflon Man's the one thing I wanted to get into. So as much as nice guys try to look good and get people to like them, the above defenses keep people at arm's length. And you guys are going to love where this is going, by the way. Like most nice guy patterns, these unconscious behaviors actually accomplish the exact opposite of what the nice guy really craves. While desiring love and connection, his behaviors serve as an invisible force field that keeps people from being able to get close to him. Nice guys have a difficult time comprehending that in general, people are not drawn to perfection in others. They are drawn to shared interests, shared problems, and an individual's life energy, whatever the hell that means. So I'm going to go back to this one. People are not drawn to perfection in others. Now, I want you to think about that next time you're on Twitter and you see a guy, alpha male 7.0, or uh, I own five Lamborghinis and I only do nines and tens. Bravado is probably one of the least attractive and strongest insecure nice guy behaviors around. And that's why you have a hard time following instagram models talking about how great they are or pickup guys talking about how great they are or a dude in central florida who says he's the greatest man in the manosphere el presidente all those guys and you've never been able to put your finger on what it is about them that's kind of off-putting but once you understand it from the paradigm of a nice guy it makes perfect sense that perfection is off-putting because you know it's a lie it may be aspirational everybody would love to be perfect I mean, if you're a nice guy, you would expect to be because then everybody would love you unconditionally and your life would go without problems. So you think, yeah, that guy's got the Lamborghini. Yeah, that guy's got the nines and tens. Yeah, that guy runs a, you know, all those things that people do that you see online. And it's just, 
it only works on the type of person that already is that same nice guy. Now, this is blowing your mind. Just wait till it. When we say nice guy, we don't just mean ineffective, weak kind of men, like a beta male is what you would think of. That's not it at all. There's some guys that are extremely tough. You would look at them, think, wow, he's like built like the rock. He's got a gruff voice like Clint Eastwood. This is a man's man, but he still has these same nice guy behaviors. That's why all he can do is brag about his abs or brag about how many girls he's had or brag about this and talk about how great he is that and his Lamborghini and his six figure income and his side hustle, all that stuff, all lies. I guarantee you underneath it is a scared little boy who just wants mommy to love him. Or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they actually are as great as they say they are perfect. But every time, every time I've seen the claim, give it six months and the cracks start to show. So that's Teflon, men, And that's, and I guess this is kind of, I'm not sure if this is a branding thing or a real life thing. I'm guessing both. You'll notice some guys tend to be self-aware about the Teflon man, but they haven't really gotten past that insecurity. So what they'll do is they'll lead with their flaws. Again, remembering back where we talked about uh, the good guy paradigm and the I'm a bad person paradigm, like nice guys do both. This is the ones that lead with, and I know it's a bit of a joke, but yeah, I've been to prison. You know, I'm a nice guy now, though. They always lead with these things that are negatives, and they use them as if they're positives. I think Rollo refers to this as turning your your virtues or your vices into virtues. And it's the exact same Teflon man behavior as I own a Lamborghini or I have six-figure income, that kind of stuff, which, I mean, six figures, a lot of people earn it. So I'm not saying everybody with a six-figure income is a nice guy. I'm just saying the guys that brag about it tend to be. Same as the guys that are like, you know, I've messed up. I used to do crack. I've been to prison, blah, blah, blah. It's the same thing, but different flavor. Well, you can't use this against me. I just said it myself. So we just canceled out my bad guy behavior. Now you have to love me. It's like, no, dude, a normal functioning human being who's healthy with his mental models will realize like you don't brag about your badness to hide it either. You just don't brag about it. Like I... In a million years, a normal self-actualized man would never think about bragging about going to jail. That would be, of course, uh, that would be shameful. And there's this thing he talks about in here, the difference between guilt and shame. Or I guess you'd be, yeah. But uh, we'll get to that one later here. I don't want to jump the boat on that. And the actionable stuff for you is identifying the approval-seeking behavior helps nice guys to learn to approve of themselves. And he says, as odd as this may sound, and this is odd, nice guys have to practice being themselves. When he says that, it's not in the be yourself way that most girls say that, you know, girls will love you if you just be yourself. He means be yourself as in act as your own mental point of origin. Act without regard to the effect it has on others. I mean, outside of, I know if I punch somebody in the face, it's going to hurt them. Like, there's, I want to say there's a nuance, but you know what? I hate don't eat paint warnings. So if a guy hears this and thinks that he gets to act like a complete dick around everybody to shed his knife guy, then I don't know what to tell him. You need to learn to apply this properly. So yeah, what do I want? What feels right to me? What would make me happy? Um, he has an example here of a guy, Cal. Now, Cal loved his car. He polishes, he washes his car, waxes his car. He thinks his car is what impressed people and made them like him. So Glover's uh, example there was to have him just not wash his car. Don't wash, don't vacuum your car for the next month. And then he would eventually drive around. He assumed everybody was looking at his filthy car and thought poorly of him. And he was horrible, anxiety attacks, all that stuff. But by the end of it, he realized nobody treated him any different whether the car was clean or not. Nobody really cared. And then at the end, he just realized, okay, it's a sense of relief. So it's not whether I'm liked or not liked based on my car. I don't need that attachment. So now when he goes to wash his car, he does that because he has a sense of pride in it. It's his nicest favorite car. He likes treating it well, but it doesn't come attached with that external validation required from other people. And again, sometimes the action can be identical in a nice guy and a normal self-actualized man. The difference is the motivations. It's just one of those things. And then he talks about um, good things. Doing good things to take care of yourself will are small steps towards shedding your nice guy behaviors. This is, if you've been 
even red pill aware, you should know this stuff. So he says here, exercise, workout, go for a walk, eat healthy, get sleep, relax, get a massage, go out with buddies, buy new shoes, get your shoes polished, get dental work done, get a physical, listen to music. If this sounds like the first three steps of dread, as the blue pill professor put it, you're right. Build a frame, build your own mental point of origin, build hobbies outside of your relationship with your wife. Learn to respect, learn to respect your own boundaries and your time and attention and commitment doesn't come without a value add from the other person. That's specifically what we're talking about here. Um, I'll end this section on this. So as the recovering nice guy does good things for himself, he'll begin to feel uncomfortable. He may feel frightened, anxious, guilty, or confused. These feelings are the result of what's caused, what's called cognitive dissonance. I'm sure you guys have heard me at least once or twice say your feelings are dumb and or your feelings are bad and you should feel bad for having them. This is exactly what I'm referring to here. If you've been sexually unsuccessful, financially unsuccessful, whatever method of unsuccess that brought you to my doorstep, you're going to be doing something painfully different. We're talking about, you know, be a little bit of an asshole, hater just a little bit, your own mental point of origin, you do you, rational self-egoism, all this stuff. So you get there and you're getting the guy to do these things on his own. The gym bag routine is one like a little game I show guys to play to practice as an exercise and they feel bad. They can't really explain why, but they just don't like it. It's awkward and they start coming up with justifications as to, well, maybe I should just do this. Well, I'll go to the gym when she acts like this, but I'll come back with flowers. And you're like, no, 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 you're supposed to feel bad because this is being attractive and not being unattractive is a new space for you. So if you don't feel any discomfort, if you don't feel awkward, if it doesn't feel wrong, then you're not doing it right. So if anything, you have to feel bad. If you don't feel bad, you're not making any growth. Something for you guys to think about, though, moving forward. Um, here's the one thing. So it's funny. A lot of us have some issues with uh, No More Mr. Nice Guy. For example, his first section there, he says, bring it up with your wife, talk about it together. Um... Flat out, no. In everybody's experience, does not work. Girl doesn't need the book to become the authority. It's supposed to be you. So if she asks what you're reading, you're just like, I don't know, a book somebody recommended me, and that's all you say on it. He talks about positive affirmations, helping nice guys learn to approve of themselves. Again, it's too much of a feeling thing. I don't know. Maybe it works. I've never seen it work. It's never worked for me. Nobody's ever reported that telling themselves they're a cool alpha male has done anything but make them a really crappy brand online. So... <laughs> you do you if you want to get to that part. Um, spending time alone helps nice guys learn to approve of themselves. Again, this one is, it kind of comes with the territory. We don't specifically talk about go somewhere and be by yourself. It just kind of comes. Like if you need to read No More Mr. Nice Guy and When I Say No I Feel Guilty and Rational Male and your girl's constantly nagging you and you're in a horrible marriage, then yeah, you're going to want to be alone just because you need a place to focus. Like one of our one of our moderators and guy, I've probably started same time. I think we started the same week. He used to drive out into a Walmart parking lot, read his book by candlelight because he was just needed out of the space. So the alone time kind of naturally comes with shedding unattractive behavior. So I don't feel a need to harp on about it. And the self-help thing, like this whole thing is self-help, so I don't like how he has to have a whole section back onto it again. Just write it down. Honestly, field reports in a locker room is all you really need. And that'll shed through all this stuff. But uh, we'll end on this. So by shedding their chameleon skin and learning to please themselves, recovering nice guys begin to experience the intimacy and connection they've always desired. By learning to approve of themselves, they begin to radiate a life energy and charisma that draws people to them. As nice guys stop seeking approval and stop trying to hide their perceived flaws, they open a door to start getting what they want in love and life. And that's the key to it. If you take nothing else from this part here and you're the young single guy, don't brag about your Lamborghini. Don't brag about your six figures. Don't try to be perfect because perfection is the best enemy of just normal functioning. Because here's what happens. You're not perfect. And everybody who says they're perfect knows they're not. Anybody who's an alpha male one thing you can say for sure is that you're definitely not. Once you do that, people don't feed into that. And then when they don't feed into that, it builds a cycle of resentment and anger. And this is what that uh, thing that as a nice guy you need to avoid. But so that's section three. 
No more Mr. Nice Guy. I see a bunch of you guys in the chat. We're going to spend a few minutes here and then we're going to call it. Look at you guys. Very busy. All right. Smash that like button. Feel free to subscribe. I'm doing a bunch more of these. I'm probably going to do section four this week. And eventually going to switch back to the red pill sidebar for the single guy stuff. Um, I'll end on Republic of Awesome's comment here. So I was a nice guy for years and didn't know it. I just thought it was being a good guy, doing all the things people I trusted told me I needed to do. AKA, don't be like your dad. Yeah, dude. A lot of this isn't malicious either. That's the thing. Like, this didn't come out of a vacuum. Promise Keepers is one element of it where, you know, you love your mom. She's the first person that imprinted on you when you were a kid because dad left or dad was kicked out of the house. Don't be like your dad is like a common good guy thing that they, it's not... I will do what I think they want me to do is they flat out tell you what they want you to do for that uh, love that they're offering, which is weird because a parent's love is supposedly unconditional. So when they start throwing conditions on that, it's a really subtle way of brainwashing a kid, which my expectation is this is why it's good to have two functioning parents because there's always at least one of them who's crazy or they're both crazy, but in different sides. So you eventually learn that Okay, this is not congruent at all, and you learn to kind of carve and understand your own mental model. So it's pretty neat to learn. Um, on that note, thank you guys for subscribing to this one. I'll catch you on the next one, and cheers. Oops. Let's go outro. Thank you, Vincent, by the way, for the two pound super chat. Keep it up, Ryan. Don't worry, man. We got tons of these down the pipe.